Ayub, are we all set? Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to the second day of the SDHS uh, First International Online Conference. Uh, my name is Ayub Tubal, and I, and I will be the moderator for this session that will have um, three presentations. The first two presentations will be by Dr. Tim Donnelly, and the third will be by Dr. Celso de Costa. Um, our first speaker, Dr. Tim Donnelly, um, is a periodontist that owns um, a private practice in Bowling Green, Kentucky, USA. Dr. Tim is an international scholar with many, uh, with many published articles and books. Um, he's a graduate of Georgetown University School of Dentistry. Um, then he finished his residency at Indiana Medical Center. Um, before, uh, before I leave the microphone to Dr. Tim, I would like to remind you all um, of the evaluation that will appear on, um, on top of the screen. And also, if you have any questions, uh, the, the question answer mode is um, open. You could type your questions for the speaker. Okay, without uh, further ado, I give the microphone to Dr. Tim Donnelly. Dr. Tim? Yes, thank you, Ayub. Go ahead. All right, let me share my screen here and pull up the presentation. Yes, I, I'm quite honored to be part of the first Saudi Dental Hygiene Society meeting. Let me add my thanks to the organizers, the sponsors, the attendees, to one of the smartest people I've met in dentistry, someone that I absolutely am honored to call my friend, and that is Mr. Ayub Tabal. When my course proposal was accepted for this meeting, I asked Ayub if he would like me to make the presentation in Arabic or English, and he said English would be fine, which is a very good thing because I do not speak Arabic. The only words that I know, which I will share with you all this morning, and it is morning here in Kentucky, is marhaba, and assalamu uh, alaikum. I am indeed honored to be part of this very historic event. All pandemics have two parts, the spread of disease and the spread of fear about catching the disease. And it's that second fear that leads to hysteria, panic, loss of rational behavior, which is easily spread on social media. That fear has led to many self-proclaimed experts peddling supposed solutions. It's led to regulatory bodies making recommendations that really are neither scientifically based or reasonable. At the stroke of a regulatory pen, dentistry at the time the pandemic hit was deemed to be non-essential. I'm gonna make a strong case that the exact opposite is true that in fact, in times of pandemic, we are especially essential. If you look at social media, the fear is quite obvious. In a recent post, in response to changing guidelines, one responder suggested that there are contaminated aerosols floating around in the operatories. Has anybody talked about this? Yes, I will assure you that we know a lot about that, and in fact, we can handle it safely. And yet another one said, will DDSs listen? I heard that being a dental hygienist is number one for the spread of COVID. That statement is patently false. Although it's often repeated, I'm gonna suggest to you that dental hygiene can be one of the safest professions. And lastly, a responder suggested, I'm not gonna risk my life just to clean someone's teeth. Well, the great news is today is you don't have to risk your life, but I'll also tell you that you should be doing more than just cleaning teeth. The fact of the matter is this fear and confusion is not a good look for our profession. This has adversely affected our patients, our practices. I think it's affecting our profession. 
and even from a personal standpoint, psychologically, to be a contributing member of dentistry. This has made it really difficult to keep all of that in perspective. What I'd like to share with you today is a way to perhaps change our message and to change our approach. And I'll begin by suggesting to you, indeed, the pandemic needs dentistry. We now know that those at high risk for severe illness from COVID-19 include patients with underlying conditions, the ones that adversely affect the body's immune system. In a recent study, 94% of hospitalized patients had one or more underlying conditions, the most common underlying conditions that make it more challenging for someone who contracts COVID-19 to respond to that infection, that makes it more likely that they're gonna have a difficult time. Those common comorbidities are hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. There's now overwhelming evidence that chronic inflammatory periodontal disease is affected by hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. We're players in that arena. We know that chronic systemic inflammation has the potential to increase the risk for subsequent infections. Well, there also is overwhelming evidence that chronic inflammatory periodontal disease contributes to the systemic burden of inflammation. We know without question that patients that are walking around with persistent oral inflammation are contributing to the systemic burden of inflammation. We know that as systemic inflammation rises, it adversely affects the immune response. Not only are we not non-essential in times of the pandemic, we are indeed in the front lines if the world in general wants to make improvements in stopping the pandemic. If we can help patients achieve and maintain a preferred level of oral health, we are improving their immune response we're reducing the likelihood that they're gonna have the comorbidities that make dealing with the pandemic more difficult for those patients. We, in fact, are essential. Dental healthcare providers are the only ones who can deliver maximally effective dental therapy, which is vital to reducing the systemic inflammation and to maximizing the immune response. But with that said, I'm well aware of the fact that the reason most of us are tuning in today is because we wanna know if we can find it, a way to do it safely. I hope to clear a lot of the confusion that has been generated by the fear and the anxiety in the pandemic. I hope to clear a lot of that confusion up because indeed there is a way for us to fulfill our vital role and to do it in a way that's safe. The concern of course is with splatter and aerosols. We know without question that there are several things in the dental space that have the potential to generate splatter and aerosols. Now I'll tell you from the outset, I speak at least with a little bit of authority. One of the projects I was involved in a couple years ago was co-authoring the first ever textbook on ultrasonic debridement. And in that effort, we became conversant with all of the literature that's available, looking at exactly what we can say for sure about aerosol generation. And today we're talking specifically about aerosol generation for the dental hygienist with the ultrasonic device and other methods commonly employed. Here's what we can say for sure. For the sake of argument, rather than discussing the, whether aerosols occur or not, without question, they have the potential to be generated. The ultrasonic has the potential to generate aerosols. Instead of worrying about exactly how far that spreads, let's assume that aerosols spread up to lots of feet, lots of meters in the dental treatment space. We, they can land on the floor, they can land on surfaces, they can land on us, the dental health care provider, they can land on the patient. Instead of arguing how long these aerosols last in the air, let's just assume that they last for a long period of time. We know that they can be inhaled. Realizing all of these things that we can say for sure, please let's also stop and remember that there's an asterisk next to each of these claims. The fact of the matter is aerosols do happen. They can spread lots of feet. They can land on surfaces. They can linger for lots 
of time, we have the potential to inhale them. But the asterisk is, unless they are controlled at the point of creation before they can escape into the ambient air. Yes, aerosols are a problem, aerosol generating procedures, unless the aerosol is controlled before they escape into the ambient air. And the great news today is we have evidence supporting protocols to completely control the aerosol. I understand why the popular questions during the pandemic are, should we avoid the use of ultrasonic? But perhaps better questions for us to ask as clinicians include, can we do what's best for our patients without using the ultrasonic? Because one of the professional responsibilities that we have is providing patients with the most efficacious care, providing them with a care that has the maximum chance to achieve the desired result. And in this time of pandemic, we now clearly understand that achieving a maximum result, maximum resolution of inflammation can pay oral and systemic benefits. Then secondly, can we use ultrasonics in a way that's safe? And once again, I completely understand the concern, mostly driven by fear. Let's look at what science says. Well, in terms of the first question, can we achieve an adequate outcome without the use of ultrasonic? We want to provide maximally effective debridement. We know that the host response is initiated to biofilm. Yes, of course, we've all been trained that you need to remove this stuff here, the plaque and the calculus that forms on the tooth. And we've all used kind of a now you see it, now you don't, or now you feel it and now you don't approach to determine when we're finished removing plaque and calculus. But please also remember that we now understand that the biofilm is what is the etiology. The etiology is in the form of a biofilm. Biofilm describes what bacteria do in an aqueous environment. When surrounded by fluid, bacteria by nature secrete proteoglycans and other substances that form a protective shell around the bacteria. Biofilm's microscopic. It's only when that biofilm grows to the point where we identify it as plaque, and it's only when that plaque calcifies and those calcium crystals grow to the point where we can see it or we can feel it that we regard it as plaque uh, and we regard it as calculus. But not all biofilm grows to the point where it becomes visible plaque. Not all calculus calcifies to the point where it's clinical calculus. You could conceivably remove the plaque and calculus in, on the clinical tooth image that you see on the screen. And indeed, health may be restored. But if you wanted to maximize the chance that inflammation is resolved, you would also want to expose the affected root surface to a method capable of interrupting all of the etiology, not just the plaque and calculus, but any microscopic etiology. Well, in addition for debridement to being microscopic, we also have to start to think about debridement being topographical. When you look, for instance, at the CEJ, this is how a typical CEJ looks. There are typically microenvironments where biofilm hides it's inconceivable to think that you could take a hand instrument and get into these nooks and crannies and adequately interrupt the biofilm. Unfortunately, it's not possible. When we say substitute ultrasonics with hand instruments only, in essence, what we're saying is less than adequate therapy is okay for this patient. Perhaps it would be better to say if there are sites that need ultrasonic instrumentation, is there a way to do it safely? Well, the fact of the matter is there's a couple other parameters that we have to consider before we answer that question. That traditional approach that certainly I was trained on and many of you might still have been trained on of achieving a glassy smooth surface has long gone by the wayside. That was actually born in what I would like to call ignorant times when we didn't realize that there was a microscopic aspect to etiology. 
we thought that the etiology was plaque and calculus and we had to get to good solid cementum surfaces to remove the etiology. We've actually known for 30 years that the biofilm is in the outer 40 microns of the root. Not only do we not want to remove cementum, we don't need to remove cementum. The fact of the matter is preserving cementum actually results in a better level of attachment. We don't want a glassy smooth surface anymore. We want to preserve cementum. So perhaps it would be reasonable to conclude that to achieve maximally effective debridement, we have to remove what I call calculus. And what I mean by that is clinically evident calculus without removing any cementum. We need to interrupt a biofilm without removing any cementum. And I would submit to you, I don't think that's possible without the use of ultrasonics. In terms of getting the calculus off, the clinical calculus, indeed, you have the choice of ultrasonics or hand instrumentation. And while you absolutely can use both of those to achieve an adequate outcome in terms of removing the clinical calculus, if you use a hand instrument, you have to first maneuver the instrument beyond the calculus to the apical extent of the calculus. You have to put a level of force to dislodge the calculus and you have to stop when you get to the coronal border of the calculus. Otherwise, you're gonna risk damaging those very fragile cemental enamel rods at the CEJ. It's possible to do this, but it's really difficult clinically. And of course, what most of us do is in essence, we close our eyes, we stick the curette to the base of the pocket and we give it a few good scrapes until it feels smooth. We're probably removing too much cementum when we do that. With ultrasonic instrumentation used properly, and that's a very important qualifier. One of the reasons we wrote the textbook is very few people use ultrasonics properly. Using cor correct insert at the correct angulation with the correct settings, this is the most efficient way to remove calculus. We actually used properly can remove calculus from the coronal direction, which allows us to stop when we get to the apical extent. We actually can remove just the calculus without affecting the underlying cementum. But let's assume that you're comfortable removing calculus with hand instrumentation, and you can do it without excessive cementum removal. While that's possible, I don't think it's possible to remove the microscopic biofilm. We can't get the hand instrumentation to get into all of those nooks and crannies. Now, in the interest of trying to get to the most important information first, without belaboring things, we unfortunately do not have the time to go through the literature on methods of interrupting microscopic biofilm. But I would suggest to you, and I will make myself available later, I'll give you contact information where you can contact me if we need to discuss this further. I think this probably is how things rate from the most efficient to the least efficient in terms of removing microscopic biofilm. And when I say most efficient, what I mean is most likely to interrupt the greatest amount of biofilm into all of those topographical areas that exist at the microscopic level that are safest or can be made safest for us and for the patient and have the most literature support, the unbiased literature suggesting that this is a realistic, reasonable way to interrupt biofilm. While there might be some argument among that, I think this is a reasonable way to rate those. As a result, we have to use ultrasonic instrumentation, at least in sites where inflammation has persisted despite hand instrumentation, assuming that that persistence of inflammation is due to etiology that isn't accessed by hand instrumentation. So then the next question becomes, if we need to use ultrasonic instrumentation, can we do it safely? Of course, what the pandemic has done has accentuated the concern of the safety. We realize that indeed there is the potential for transference of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which leads to COVID-19. But if you understand the chain of infection, what's necessary for you to actually contract
COVID-19. You'll realize that each step along the chain provides an opportunity for us to interrupt this chain. And if we can interrupt it, you will not convert and become COVID-19 positive. In fact, care that you provide will become safe. Well, we know that we have to have an infectious agent and SARS-CoV-2 virus certainly seems to cata fit that category based on the evolving evidence. There has to be a reservoir of the virus. Certainly in patient secretions, we know that the virus is present in the respiratory epithelium. There is evidence, uh, I'm sorry, there is research ongoing. I'm involved in some of this, looking at the presence of the receptors for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The ACE uh, converting enzyme receptors which is in the cells to which the virus attaches. The virus then goes into the cells and replicates. Those ACE converting enzyme receptors have been noted on oral epithelium in addition to respiratory epithelium. So we know that the patient, if they're COVID positive, has the potential to shed viruses. Those virus particles can land on contaminated surfaces. And the current research, while admittedly things are changing rapidly, Currently, the available evidence to date, to date suggests that really aerosol isn't the biggest issue, but rather the droplets that are expressed by patients that land on surfaces. You have to have a mode of transmission. We know that the virus is present in body fluids. It's potentially present in aerosols that are not captured in, on fomites, on surfaces on which those body fluids land. There has to be an infectious dose. That very famous study in the New England Journal from Wuhan, China, where they noted that the virus was present in COVID positive wards on many surfaces for great lengths of time throughout the hospital. Indeed, they were able to recover virus particle, but in subsequent study, they took that recovered virus particle, put it on growth media that was set up to maximize the chance for the virus to replicate. And in zero instances was the virus that they recovered able to replicate. Now that's important. Yes, indeed, we know that SARS-CoV-2 has the potential to spread. The question of whether a, an infectious dose is generated is certainly up to debate. You have to have a portal of entry. We know that it's the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. If we protect our eyes, nose, and mouth, we can break the chain of infection. We have to have a susceptible host. Now that makes sense, not only in terms of patients to, for them to boost their response, and my underlying contention is improving their oral health improves their overall immune response, which makes them less susceptible. But the same goes for us. And I'll close this first presentation by suggesting a few things that we can and should do to improve our own resistance to disease. We have to have contact with the actual agent. And if in fact that chain is not broken, yes, we will test positive for COVID-19. But rather than latching on to the fact that it's potentially positive, it potentially possible to test positive, please realize that all of these steps in the chain of infection represent possible areas where we can break the chain of infection and achieve our goal of providing necessary therapy for patients in a way that's safe for us. Now, once again, in an effort to get to the most important information in the time that we have available, I'll look at this from a real world scenario. In a real world scenario, there are basically three areas that we need to address. We need to minimize pathogen release by the patients. We need to protect ourselves against pathogen contact. And we need to protect ourselves to boost our response against infectious agents. And I'll list these in areas of priority. We'll start with how to minimize pathogen release. Indeed, the first common suggestion that's made is high volume evacuation. I think this merits a little bit of further discussion. We don't have a great understanding, many clinicians, on exactly what's happening with the high volume evacuation. There are typically two connections, 
vacuum system first. The low volume evacuator, which is typically used for water and saliva, and the high volume evacuator, which is designed to capture spatter or aerosol particles. Interestingly enough, we now have evidence that high volume of evacuation removes 93 to 96% of aerosols. Now think about that. We can use high volume evacuation to capture 96% of the generated aerosol. The N95 mask, which we all should and need to wear, only filters out 95% of it. We can do better than the N95 mask if we use high volume evacuation. So the first thing I would suggest, and many of us over the years have gotten into a bad habit of using the saliva ejector. Yes, we need to control the water in the saliva during the ultrasonic procedure, but we absolutely wanna use high volume evacuation. But once again, like many things, as scientists, we have to apply our scientific scrutiny to this. There's an asterisk next to that statement as well. And a lot of the fear and the anxiety is driving a lot of these third party, so supposed expert solutions. And what I mean by that is yes, HVE removes 93 to 96% of the aerosols with a couple of caveats. To understand what actually makes HVE effective, you have to realize that there is nothing magical about the HVE collection valve. Both the high volume evacuation and the low volume evacuation are connected to the exact same vacuum pump in the office. The only thing that's different between the two is the diameter of the tube that's attached to it. And in fact, it's a basic concept of physics in terms of fluid dynamics, that the amount of aerosol that will be captured depends on the diameter and the shape at the point of capture and the amount of vacuum force. Now, unfortunately, we aren't yet too well ad adept at determining what the vacuum force is in offices. I would certainly suggest to you that you want to make sure that the vacuum system that you have in your office is operating properly, that it's rated for the size of your office. Typically, the size of the, the number of operatories in an office is used to determine how big of a vacuum pump you need. But let's assume for the sake of argument that the vacuum is set. We have an adequate vacuum in the office. What's going to make a difference, what's going to allow us to remove 93 to 96% of the aerosol is the diameter and the shape of the capture device that's attached to this. All of the studies that were done, all of the studies that were done looked at using a large bore, eight millimeter plus collection tube, the typical disposable HVE suction tube. That's what the studies have demonstrated can remove 93 to 96%. All of those studies indeed were done using a functioning vacuum. The fact of the matter is you can't just attach anything to the HVE and consider it able to remove 93 to 96%. The only thing we can say right now based on the evidence is that a large bore, eight millimeter plus opening attached to a functioning vacuum can remove up to 96% of the aerosol. The reason I make this point is to answer what the if is. The fact of the matter is, this is what we need to use chair side to control the aerosol before it escapes into the environment. What has happened because of the confusion and the fear is industry has rushed into the marketplace a variety of things that attached to the HVE line. Many of these companies suggest that indeed they remove 93 to 96% of the aerosol. And they make that assumption based on the fact that this connects to the HVE line. But remember, it's not just a matter of connecting to the HVE line. It's the diameter of the capture device. 
many of these things are promoted on Facebook. They seem to be coming out of the woodwork every day with different devices that are supposedly going to help us make a huge impact in managing this aerosol problem. While some of these devices may have merit, we have not seen the data yet. They've not been studied to determine their effect on reducing aerosols. They piggyback, if you will, onto the data that was done looking at eight millimeter bore devices. If you have multiple holes in a device that hooks up to the HVE, even if the surface area of those multiple holes equal a total of eight millimeters, you're not gonna get the same airflow because of the resistance that's imparted between the small holes that are present. There's a whole dynamic physics property that goes into determining how to maximize the aerosol. While these different devices are sold to us based on the fact that they may be more ergonomic, you can have it with a mirror that's illuminating, that retracts the tissue, that also manages the water. All of those things are wonderful additions. But in this time of pandemic, before you go out and buy one of these things, you have to ask yourself, show me the data. Show me the data that suggests that these do a better job than 96% reduction. Not the data that's on Facebook, not the images where they show four Petri dishes that are covered. And then in the next, when you swipe right, there's an image where the Petri dishes have nothing on them. We want good evidence-based reviewed data that suggests that these devices are at least equal to a large bore capture device. Now, I will tell you from a clinical standpoint, there is a standard, very few people are familiar with this, but there is an established standard. The pandemic has focused our interest in coming up with the ideal design to maximize fluid flow. What we know so far is that the diameter and the shape makes a difference, but it's not unending. We can't just simply increase the diameter as large as possible. Those standalone capture devices that have the huge hood that goes over the patient up to a certain diameter, depending on the amount of force being generated by the vacuum, when it gets too large, it actually changes the pattern of airflow and it has the potential for that airflow to then actually concentrate materials going right past where the breathing uh, of the operator is. Yes, we want to always use HVE. We want to use HVE on a functioning system, at least eight millimeter bore capture device, or using a device that's been proven to remove even more than 96%. From a clinical experience, the only commercially available device on the marketplace is indeed the PureVac by Denseply. And I want to be very clear, I have staunchly been independent and I pride myself on taking the available science and making recommendations that indeed are science-based. I am not supported by any industry. I'm certainly not here to make any commercial recommendation. The PureVac HVE is eight millimeter plus. It's been designed to maximize air capture that's what we use in our office. In fact, if you're practicing alone, there are some standalone devices that can make that easier. This is one of them, Golden Dent. There are plenty other manufacturers that make products like this, which is a clamp that hooks on to the chair that helps hold it in essence, provides a third hand to allow you to better position the necessary HVE when you're doing ultrasonic procedures. The second thing that I would consider is to completely change our approach. The whole concept of full mouth debridement probably should be re-examined. Typically, when patients come in for their hygiene visit, we start back at the distal of what we call tooth number one or two, that internationally is typically number one eight or one seven. And we start up the one side and down the other side and whatever debridement procedure we do, we give everything the once over to make sure that we haven't missed anything. In this time of pandemic, and in fact, even beyond the pandemic, 
I think it makes more sense rather than a full mouth debridement approach to provide necessary treatment at the sites where it's absolutely necessary to do it as definitively as possible in the shortest amount of time. We treat the problem sites. We no longer have patients leaving the hygiene visit with the patient bib completely soaked, holding a paper towel because the liquid's running down their neck. Instead of kind of a shotgun approach, we take a hired assassin approach. We determine where the treatment, the, the problem sites are. We put maximum treatment at the problem sites. Yes, we use ultrasonic instrumentation. We use it with H with HVE with an eight millimeter plus large bore with a functioning vacuum, but we only use it at problem sites. It is the most efficient and effective way for us to achieve the desired result in the shortest amount of time. In essence, we call this selective debridement. You know, the goal, the goal is to get our patients inflammation free and to keep them that way. To do that, when you're chair side, when you have the probe in your hand, you're deciding what to do. When your patient comes in for their hygiene visit, I ask myself at every site, is there evidence of bleeding upon probing? We know bleeding upon probing is a strong predictor of inflammation. Has the pocketing or the attachment loss increased since the last visit? If there's inflammation, we treat that site. If the pocketing or the attachment loss is increasing, we treat that site. But then we ask ourselves, using our clinical judgment, is the site maintainable? There are some instances where we won't see inflammation. Tobacco use, for instance, as we know, can mask inflammation. The problem sites that we determine which to treat, which we're going to use ultrasonic instrumentation at, are the ones where there's evidence of bleeding upon probing, especially persistent bleeding upon probing over time, at sites where the probing depth has increased over time, or at sites where our clinical judgment says, because of the existing bone loss, because of the shape of the root, there's no way that the patient's gonna be able to maintain that. We treat those sites. Those are the sites that we put maximum effort in. Now it's admittedly difficult in a 30 second sound bite to make sense of this. I will make it available, the slides available to everybody. This might be one you wanna go back to and make sure you're clear in your own mind. What are our problem sites? What's our definition? Which sites do we need to treat and how do we do it most efficiently? We want to provide necessary treatment as definitively as possible in the shortest amount of time. I would completely avoid using the Profico. We're in such uproar over the use of the ultrasonic device. This has the potential to spread droplets and spatter to the greatest degree. I was thrilled to watch Mr. Tobal's presentation yesterday, realizing that the Saudi statement, which is superb, by the way, I've worked with a couple of different states in the United States in developing our back to work protocols. You guys nailed it in terms of recommendations. The fact of the matter is there is no need to do this therapeutically. There's great risk. When you do this, you then have to squirt the remaining profi paste off with the air water syringe. We've completely eliminated this. Now we, at least in the States, have a little bit of a problem because we've convinced patients over the last 30 years that this is the most important part of the procedure. We have to change minds. That requires a little bit of communication. We tell patients when they come into the operatory in this post-pandemic time, in essence, we say to them, look, there's a different sheriff in town. We're doing things differently. We're no longer doing this. We now know that the Profi really doesn't provide any therapeutic effect. Yes, it makes your teeth feel smooth. We still duplicate that. At the end of the procedure, we take a cotton pellet, we use hydrogen peroxide, and we burnish that onto the tooth surfaces, which gives patients that exact same feel that they want. This also is one of those layers that cuts down on the potential, that cuts down on the potential breaks the chain of infection. The pre-rinsing story is another one of those factors that actually has changed. We've always had data to suggest 
that betadine, hydrogen peroxide, and chlorhexidine has the potential as a pre-rinse to cut down on pathogens. But again, in an effort to kind of get to the most critical information, please realize that the evidence is only moderate. There hasn't been overwhelming evidence that pre-rinsing really makes that much of a difference. All that's been demonstrated and all that's been studied is pre-rinsing in reducing bacteria, colony forming units. There's never been evidence that pre-rinsing has any effect on disease transmission. And then practically, we also realize that pre-rinsing, even if it has antiviral properties, is not gonna have any effect in the nasopharynx or the bacteria that's in biofilm or in subgingival pathogens. While our American Dental Association initially recommended pre-rinsing, as did the CDC, they have since retracted that. In the most recent recommendations, they noted that there is no clinical studies supporting the virucidal effects of any pre-procedural mouth rinse. Now, we use pre-procedural mouth rinse in our practice to cut down on the bacterial components. But I guess the message is don't rely on this don't have a false sense of security that this is providing any real protection. One of the other projects that I'm currently working on is a literature review on the whole concept of pre-rinsing in this age of COVID. What we know works, what's been proven to be uh, antiviral and the evidence to suggest that it's beneficial, that's almost ready for publication. When it is ready, I will be more than happy to send a pre-publication copy to uh, the Saudi Dental Hygiene Society for distribution to members. I don't want to belabor the next category, which is protecting against pathogen contact. This, of course, is PPE. In the States, we're not quite as wealthy as all of Dr. you. Yes. Um, sorry to interrupt you. I just want to remind you of the time. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, almost over. 11.42 and we go to 11.45, is that correct? Yes. Yes, I'm almost finished. All right, thanks. Thank you, sir. In terms of PPE, the concern, of course, is using uh, protection, face mask, level three masks, N95. We recently published a back to work report, which I'll make available to you. And this has a review of all of that information, pre-screening patients. In terms of protecting the environment, many of us are going out and purchasing units that have the ability, negative pressure, anti-rooms. I will simply say to you that while a lot of these products are being rushed to market, there are things like negative pressure and HEPA filtration. Those are important, but there's a whole lot of other things that have to be considered. Air exchanges, duct disinfection, the room seal, temperature, humidity, the coils of your HVAC unit, all of these play a role. It's much more complex than going out and buying one of these point of capture units, all of which were designed to capture mercury. These have been brought back out of storage and are being sold to us to protect against COVID. We really don't know yet what the preferred composition of a device like this is. I will tell you that it's much more complex than buying a UV light. To control ambient air, hospitals use UV light, but it's tremendously strong because of the tremendous danger. One of the leading experts in air quality control suggested that without engineering calculations and testing to evaluate optimum duct position and flow rate, fine particulates can concentrate and pass through the breathing zone of employees. Now, the bottom line message to this is before you go out and buy one of these things, the general feeling has been, well, it can't make it worse. No, it actually can. We don't yet know how to best handle this. I am not investing huge amounts of money into this until I know what actually works. And then lastly, and I'll close with this, protect against infection. Be kind to yourself. We've worked so hard in dentistry. Make sure that you keep yourself healthy. Drink plenty of water, get adequate sleep, healthy eating. Make sure you're getting adequate exercise. 
if you're safe, if you're sick, stay home. We actually are frontline providers. When the vaccine comes out, we, dental hygienists, should be the first people in line to get this because we are providing a service. The pandemic indeed needs dental hygiene. Yes, dental aerosolgenic procedures can cause pathogen spread in dental treatment spaces, but completely fill in the blank. Inadequately captured aerosols, we can capture them. Dental hygiene is the highest risk profession for spreading COVID. Well, that's true only if the aerosol isn't captured. If it's captured, if patients are pre-screened, if you use proper PPE, if you selectively debride, I think dental hygiene is the greatest and most protected, the safest profession. To get the slides from the, from the presentation, all of the literature that's referred to, or to contact me, go to beyondthemouth.com. This is a podcast site that I set up. Click on seminar events, and at seminar events, you'll be prompted to register for the site. Of course, there's no cost. When you register for the site, then you can use that username and password to go into the download page, and there is a specific file, Saudi Dental Hygiene Association 2020, and at that link, you'll be able to access all of the slides and all of the literature. I hope this is helpful. I'm looking forward to the next session. Thank you for letting me share this with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dunley, for your um, really interesting and informative uh, presentation. And the fact is, um, I just wanted to inform everyone that uh, Dr. Dunley was uh, my teacher um, when I was studying uh, for my undergraduate studies in, um, in the US. Okay, um, we have just one question, Dr. Donnelly. Um, I don't know if you want us to, uh, if you want to answer it right now. Uh, that would be wonderful. Okay. Um, the question um, is from uh, Ms. Dima, and she's asking about the, the supporting studies uh, for the use of, uh, um, just a minute. Yes, uh, gives, me the gives me the opportunity to clarify that just a bit. There are in fact no studies. We're not doing that for any therapeutic benefit. We're doing that for the psychological benefit. And I, I'm not familiar with exactly what the mindset is in uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Here in the States, unfortunately, we have trained our patients that at the end of the visit, they determine the success of their hygiene visit based on how smooth their teeth feel. And unfortunately, we've propagated that. The only reason we're rubbing hydrogen peroxide super gingerly is to create that smooth feeling which our patients want. We're not doing that therapeutically. And in fact, we're making sure when we do that, that we tell patients, this is the least important 